What's up guys, welcome to Daily Dose of Reddit. This is your host, Zach, and today's subreddit is r slash pro revenge. This story's called, Apprentice Engineer Pisses Off the Crew Gets Left Behind 250 Miles From Home. Lordy, I was reminded of this story after a recent phone call from an old friend. A rather long one, so sincere apologies in advance. It's part r slash pro revenge and part r slash entitled people. Some years ago, I got a gig working a weekend music festival. Fairly simple too. 10 bands per day and all pretty standard rock and roll fare. Boss man puts four of us out on the gig, me, dreadful Boris, Big Chris, and Hammer. He also said we'd be taking out an apprentice, a young lad who was the son of a local promoter. Well, always nice to have an extra pair of hands and it's good to help train the next generation. After all, that's how we learn in the past. As it turned out, this lad was about as much use as an aqua lung to a trout, and had an entitled attitude the size of a mid-ranged African country. On the journey down in the truck, he was boasting as to how he was a really good sound engineer already, and that he could probably show us a few tricks. Oh really? We get to the venue and get busy unloading the truck. We've got a 16-tonner stuffed to the gills with two sound desks, and about 16 kilowatts of sound gear for front of house and about 6 kilowatts of monitors. As you might imagine, this is pretty heavy stuff and takes all of us to safely unload and get it stacked up in places, except that after unloading the first amp rack, all on wheels but it's still around 80 kilograms, the entitled brat snottily announces that I'm a sound engineer, not a humper, and promptly strolls off. Yeah. Okay. Well, we don't really need him gumming up the works. We're all well used to slinging boxes around. So about an hour later, we've got the rig stacked up and strapped down, run out the multi-core to the front of house desk, and are ready to start cabling up and tying power into the on-site generator. Out of nowhere, the spotty oik emerges from whatever hole he had buried himself in and asks what he can do. I say, I'm gonna plug up the front of house. Perhaps you can help hammer cable up the speakers. I don't take orders from girls. Girlies. Quick side note here, Hammer was 5'9", drop dead gorgeous, and as hard as nails, hence her nickname. She was also a damn fine front of house engineer and a bloody good mate. Boris, Chris, and I collectively groan inwardly and winced in anticipation of a full 16 inch broadside from Hammer. Seriously folks, you do not want to screw with her unless you want the family jewels dangling from the nearest tree. Instead, she smiles sweetly, never a good sign, and says, well, I'm sure you'll learn something useful. I then go off to play with the front of house cables while Boris and Chris busy themselves with the monitors. A while later, I'm back on stage. Spotty Oik has wandered off again. Hammer has this resigned look on her face. What happened? I ask. Turns out that, despite cables and connector ports being well labeled, the Oik had managed to make a complete pig's ear of plugging up the amp racks. Trust me, it's very hard to make this kind of mistake. I found the Oik some moments later and told him that it was not the proper way of doing things, and that if he wasn't sure what to do, that he should always ask one of us beforehand. What then comes out of his mouth absolutely floored me. I don't need to know all that crap, I'm a sound engineer! Blink. Hammer, who was standing a few feet away, snorted derisively and rolled her eyes heavenwards. It took me a few seconds to process this particular nugget of stupid. Well, you have to know how all this works. It's part and parcel of the job. And as you're here to learn, I suggest you pay attention. Well, you're just a bunch of roadies. What do you know? Upon delivering this charming bon mo, he ambles off again, leaving me to retrieve my jaw from off the deck and hammer barely able to restrain a fit of laughter that would have incapacitated a rhino. At a guess, this idiot thought he was going to be white gloving front of house for the whole gig. An hour or so later, we're all set up and we now have a fair idea of acts that are going to be performing. In situations like this, you rarely get the opportunity of a full blown sound check, so you have to rely on experience to set the desk up from cold. Luckily, we got the first act on stage a half hour before the kickoff, so I could quickly get a rough sense of the overall setup. A bit of exposition, it's convenient to reuse channels across acts, so I generally keep the first 20 or so channels for drums, bass, and guitars, and the last half dozen or so channels for vocals. If a band comes in with anything else, percussion, brass, Tibetan nose flutes, etc., we whack them on channels in the middle, keeping things nice, simple, and consistent across the board, and becomes important in a moment. The working procedure in show is also simple. Dreadful Boris and Big Chris run the monitor desk, 
in Hammer and I run front of house. We'll do two acts before handing over to the other, saves wear and tear on the ears, and when we're not running the desk, we'll handle setting up the stage for each act and troubleshooting where necessary, as well as doing runs for food and coffee in between. We also tasked the spotty oik with helping with the stage setups, which rapidly proved problematic. We finished the first act and aimed to do the turnover within 15 minutes. Generally, the incoming act will tell us their mic requirements and we'll write up a mic plot which then gets sent up to the front of house desk. Up comes Spotty Oik with the mic plot and he goes back to help with the stage setup. As I'm checking each mic, I notice that I cannot hear the vocal channels. No sooner had I spotted this than Dreadful Boris comes on the intercom and asks me if I can hear the vocal channels. He can't hear them either. He then goes off to check the stage box where all the mics are plugged in. From all the way out front, I hear him shout, Frick me! Seconds later, he comes back on the cans. Do you know what that fucking idiot has done? Only repatched all the vocal channels so that all the plugs on the stage box are lined up neatly one after the other. His words! Ye gods. Boris rapidly repatches the mics and we're good to go again. A few hours later and I'm starting my second shift out front. I won't bore you with my experiences of riding herd on Spotty Oik on the stage shift which, shall we say, was interesting. Currently on stage is a rather nice jazz septet. I love doing jazz. Give me a nice 20 piece big band and I'm a happy bunny. Up strolls he who shall not be mentioned and asks, well can I have a go at mixing? I'm really good you know? Seeing as he here to learn, I tell him he can take the next act under my supervision. This happened to be an acoustic duo, two guitars, and two vocals. Even the most tyro engineer should be able to handle something so simple, right? WRONG! I've already said what I regarded as a sensible baseline on the faders for him to work with. First thing he does, he reaches for the master faders and cranks in another 15 decibels. No! Immediately, the rig teeters on the edge of feedback and I rapidly pull the mains back. Look and listen. Balance out the two vocals, then the guitars. Leave the mains alone. He then starts making wildly inappropriate changes to the channel's EQ. Again, the rig starts to squeak. Okay, enough. I shove him out of the way and bring it back under control. I won't fatigue you further with the endless catalog of foul ups and attitude that he managed to affect over the rest of the weekend. Suffice it to say that despite the best efforts of myself and Hammer to try and teach this guy, they all went to naught. Couple this with the constant drip, drip, drip of snide commentary about how he was really a better engineer than the rest of us, and by the end of the weekend, we're all pretty pissed off. Come the end of the event, and now it's the fun part of striking the rig and loading out. I'm being sarcastic about the fun part, by the way. Two solid days, and we're all knackered, and the last thing we want to be doing is the get out, but of course, it has to be done. It's always an all hands on deck situation, except the spotty oike has once again vanished into the woodwork. Two back breaking hours later and we're all done and the truck loaded to go home. So where is Spotty Oik? Nowhere! We give it a good 15 minutes but no joke. We then decide to go look for him. So we spent another 20 minutes trolling around the site trying to find him. Again, he's done a disappearing act. We get back to the truck, it's now close to 3am and almost simultaneously we say, screw him! We climb back aboard and drive the 250 miles back to the warehouse to unload. Next afternoon, Bossman calls me to find out why we'd left the spotty oik behind. I gave him the cliff notes and then was told that the oik had had to call his dad at 3 in the morning to come and get him, a 500 mile round trip. He then said, I never liked that promoter anyway. He was always late paying the bill on the previous gigs. Next time he calls one of the rigging crew, I'll think I'll tell him to screw off. Now I know next to nothing about audio, which is funny given the nature of my work, <laughs> but um, I think they got the message that this guy is an entitled piece of poo poo well across and you know what that's really funny they freaking they got him good <laughs> Ah, uh, yeah, that's what you get. You don't get the freaking you don't get to automatically start doing the cool part of the job without getting your hands dirty a little bit this story's called, A-Hole Tailgates Me When I'm Already Speeding, So I Set Them Up For A Speed Trap. I was driving home from a get-together and was going 65 to 67 kilometers per hour, or 41 miles per hour, in a 60, 37 miles per hour zone. Where I'm from, the police almost never pull you over if you're going 10 or less over, but will definitely pull you over for anything over that. All was well until I got closer into my area. It's less city-like and more rural, with the roads alternating 
alternating between single and double lanes. I'm on a single lane, speeding 10 or 6 miles per hour over, when a pickup truck in my rear view caught my attention. They were going a tad bit faster when they caught up to me and promptly brake a meter behind me. I was like, okay, I'll speed up to 70 or 43 miles per hour. No big deal, but they continued to tailgate me. Upon closer inspection, I could see the mug of a very angry woman who had no understanding of personal space. What ensued was a full five minutes of them completely obscuring my rear view mirror with how close they were. I was tired and kind of hungover, so I really was not in the mood to be worrying about a potential car accident thanks to her driving. I was going to pull over to let her go around when Waze gave me a heads up that a police officer was reported up ahead. This was when I decided I'm going to dole out some karma. I slowly dropped my speed from 70 or 43 miles per hour to 60 or 37 miles per hour. Now at the speed limit, this woman was furious. Why she didn't just pass me, I'll never know, but she was literally going going slightly over the midline, yelling to herself in my rear view, flashing her full brights in a weird show-offish way to get me to go faster. I did this for another minute before I realized Waze showed the cop was less than a kilometer or 0.6 miles away. I put on my turn signal, very slowly pulled over, and watched this woman flip me the bird as she whipped past me, disappearing over the hill, now going way faster than 10 kilometers over. I continued on my way, getting up to 70 kilometers per hour, 43 miles per hour, when I cleared the hill to see flashing lights ahead. Jackpot. I drove with anticipation until I got close enough to confirm it was my friend from earlier. Not wanting to miss out on hitting her with our new secret greeting, I dropped down to 60 kilometers per hour, or 37 miles per hour, peered over and flashed the bird at her. I hope you enjoy the ticket, Karen. Oh yeah, I hate when people tailgate. It, it's so stupid and dangerous, it literally does nothing for you. You're still stuck behind the person, you're at risk of getting a ticket, and you're at risk of causing injury to yourself or others. It's stupid, there's no reason to do it. This story is called, Today I Fudged Up by Buying KY at Walmart. I went to Walmart to pick up some stuff. First item on my list, bottle of the old faithful KY jelly. I walked into the pharmacy section to find all that uh, paraphernalia is now locked in a glass box. I stood there in disbelief. I have to ask for access to slip and slide now? Am I 14 again? Seriously? I was about to walk off, not wanting to ask a stranger to unlock the box. I mean, vegetable oil is cheaper anyway, right? But then a female employee just happened to walk by and ask if I needed the box opened. I sheepishly nodded my head yes, trying to not make any noise that would attract unwanted attention from the 20 people in the pharmacy line. So out of her pocket comes the loudest keychain full of keys I've ever heard. People in the toy section turned to see what the noise was and then made their kids look away. <laughs> Everyone in the pharmacy turned and looked at me like, Oh Karen, look at that fat creepy guy who's too good to buy jargons like normal people. So as she's unlocking the box, she bangs those keys all over the glass, making even more noise as she opens the door. In haste to get out of the situation as fast as possible, I reach in and grab my preferred <laughs> sex jelly product and turn to leave. She yells at me, with everyone watching, EXCUSE ME! EXCUSE ME! I HAVE TO CARRY THAT TO THE FRONT FOR YOU! Seriously? Please, tell me no. Shampoo is starting to feel like a more reasonable option at this point, so she grabs it out of my hand and starts walking. I won't have to shake the bottle because this very energetic woman, 4 foot 11 fireball, is dramatically waving HELLO at every single fellow employee with my tug goo in her hand. Meanwhile, I try to invisibly walk five paces behind her. Once my creep walk journey was finally at the front of the store, this woman led me past all the other customers and hands the jerk jelly to the manager on duty, pointed at me and said in the loudest socially acceptable voice for someone watching a playoff football game, this is for this man, and pointed at me. The manager on duty, yet another woman in my life that silently judges me, started walking without making eye contact and says, come this way. Well, uh, I had planned to do that, but after this public Walmart humiliation, I'm not sure I can muster the concentration to make this purchase necessary. We made our way to self-checkout as she held the bottle with two fingers and an outstretched arm like a dirty diaper. That's when I realized, with all the unbelievable, embarrassing display of following the hand waver to the front, I didn't get anything else on my list. My hand basket was completely empty, so my entire purchase was KY jelly. The lady looked at me and said, Is this 
all you needed? Well, yes, because I left my dignity back in the pharmacy. And that is the story of my last Walmart purchase ever. Oh, that's messed up. I feel like they were trying to make this dude feel bad. Why would they do that? Why would they lock? Okay, okay, I guess that makes sense. People, I can imagine, would steal stuff like that more often than, you know, other things normally would be stolen because a lot of people might not be completely comfortable with the idea of openly purchasing something like that. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that bell to never miss an episode.